Good evening. Why don't we get started? Um, I've heard, I've had the pleasure of already hearing Dr. Kennedy this this afternoon, and I know you're going to like to hear what he says. So uh, let's get started. I'm Dixie Anderson with the World Affairs Council, and I'm not Ellen Levy, who's listed in your program, but. She was in Portugal for spring break and came back with something, so I'm a, a last-minute substitution. So I'd like to welcome all of you on this gorgeous night, and I'm also going to give a special shout-out here and look right into the camera. But we're also video streaming this back to Western Michigan University. Um, they'll be uh, taking part in the lecture. They have a, um, a Chinese institute at the Haneke Institute at Western and really wanted to hear Dr. Kennedy. So they'll be, um, they'll be seeing and, and hearing Dr. Kennedy and then they'll be texting questions during the Q&A as well. So welcome to Western and again welcome to all of you. Now we've been pitching this book every week and you know if we would sell out I could stop mentioning this but uh, we do have the Great Decisions text um, it's a great, it's a great book for uh, studying and getting a very balanced view of all the topics that we've been studying during Great Decisions. So, please, please buy one, and so I can stop mentioning it. Um, but a fun thing for you to do is you all got a ballot on various issues concerning China and fill it out and pop it into the ballot box on your way out the door after the lecture. I don't think we've mentioned this yet this season, but our council sends in the most ballots to the Foreign Policy Association in New York City every year. We typically send in over a thousand ballots. They're compiled and are sent to the White House and Congress. So you do have a voice, and, uh, and it's um, after you listen to the, the lecture and decide where you stand on an issue, it's fun to let, to let everybody know that. Now I have to put on my glasses here, otherwise I can't see. How many are current council members? How many are here? Oh, see, I don't even have to put my glasses on. I can see there's a lot of you. I'd like to thank all of you for your support. Um, we know you believe in our mission of global education as much as we do, so we really appreciate your support and we couldn't do it without you. If you're not a member, we'd love to have you. The membership desk is open in the lobby after the lecture tonight. So, to our program. I'd like to thank our two sponsors this evening, Warner Norcross and Judd and Alpha Max Advisors. Warner has been a sponsor for a number of our programs this year, and I'd like to ask Marcus Jones, one of the lawyers that does international work there, to stand and thank you, Marcus. We appreciate the support from Warner. And we have Alpha Max as a new corporate sponsor. Alpha, Mac Advi Alpha Max Advisors is a consulting company for companies going to China or who are already there. The principles of Alpha Max um, are based here in West Michigan and have years of experience in China, and they have a lot of resources there on the ground. Representing Alpha Max here this evening is one of the principals, Ping Liang. Ping, would you stand? <laughs> now, she might look familiar to all of you because Ping is also our immediate past board president. So, um, do you miss us, Ping? <laughs> I think she does. And then I would like to thank our media sponsor, Michigan Radio, our NPR station. So thanks to all of you. If there is one topic that draws people to a program here at the World Affairs Council, it is China. 
Never has a country exploded onto the global business scene as quickly and as powerfully as China. Tonight, I'm proud that we are able to bring to Grand Rapids one of America's foremost experts on China business and trade. You can find in your programs a brief biography of Dr. Scott Kennedy. He will be presenting an insightful look at the Chinese economy and how capitalism with Chinese characteristics works. But I also hope during Q&A that someone will ask him about the business of lobbying in China, as that is one of his interests as well. Please help me welcome Dr. Scott Kennedy with his presentation, and I love this title, Mandarin's Plain Capitalist Games. Dr. Kennedy. Thanks so much. Is this working? Are we ready to roll? My button is blinking. Let's see here. This looks right. All right, try that again. Just start talking. Okay. Can you hear? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Ni hao. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, it's a wonderful honor to be here tonight, and since I've I've got more electronics stapled to me than I'm familiar with, uh, I'm an, I'm able to walk around freely. Uh, and I want to thank the World Affairs Council for inviting me tonight. For all of you. Uh, coming out, uh, I think uh, organizations like the World Affairs Council are extremely important for maintaining a vibrant democracy and obviously for the health of our economy. Uh, China is extremely important regardless of whether you live on Main Street uh, in New York City, LA, New Delhi, or Grand Rapids. Uh, and uh, tonight, I want to present a part of the China story and, and how it's uh, relevant, uh, I think, to all of us. Um, and I want to do that by talking about Chinese participation uh, in global governance regimes. Um, and as I do that, uh, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, usually, when I uh, give lectures, uh, I find it rude if, if no one asks a question in the middle or interrupts me. So don't sit on your hands. Uh, there obviously will be time at the end for questions, but if you need some point of clarification uh, in the middle, please feel free to ask, because there's going to be a lot on these PowerPoint slides that I've got behind me. And so uh, I, I really do want this to be a dialogue, because I'm also trying to learn uh, as much as I can, because this is part of a book project as well. And, and so uh, any feedback I can get from you would be uh, most uh, appreciated. Uh, many people who think about China in the United States paint China in, in very negative terms. And their general impression is that China is not living up to the commitments it's made uh, as a member of the international system. And the first piece of evidence anyone cites uh, is China's massive trade surplus with the United States, which is visible on the line behind me, uh, and is now, uh, despite the small uh, improvement from the American perspective, uh, over $230 billion. Uh, and I expect with the improvement in the economy in 2010, we ought to see the line go back in the original trend in which it has been going since the late 1980s, which is an expanding uh, trade deficit. Uh, this is for, for many people, the most important piece of evidence, and it's the one uh, that where all conversations begin in Washington in thinking about uh, whether or not the Chinese play fair. This is the second piece of evidence, the second most important, and that is Chinese currency. And uh, the RMB seems to be, according to many, uh, woefully uh, undervalued, uh, giving China an unfair advantage uh, to export uh, willy-nilly th throughout the world, uh, therefore taking jobs from Americans, uh, from their uh, neighbors in Southeast Asia and elsewhere, and uh, we've got it right there. Um, you know, China is now at 6.8 uh, renminbi to the dollar, and geez, it, people think that it should be 30, 35, 40 percent uh, stronger than it, than it is now. 
Again, the idea that China is not playing by the rules. Uh, there's other indications that people use. Uh, I've picked a story that just recently is uh, breaking uh, related to high technology. Uh, the Chinese, uh, as part of industrial policy, are trying to uh, strengthen their technological capabilities uh, and they are requiring, uh, beginning May 1 this year, any, country, any foreign company that operates in China that uses encryption technology to provide that technology to the Chinese government so it can be tested and certified. And companies are extremely concerned that in the process of having their technology tested and certified, the distance between the Chinese government and the back door to a Chinese competitor is not very far. Uh, and that's why uh, Deputy U.S. Trade Representative Deborah Meslow uh, in this story said, since then, uh, since the Chinese have announced this policy, the U.S. has continued to ask China to, to follow global norms in this area, and we are continuing those discussions. Global norms regarding technology testing, the uh, related to encryption and other types of requirements. So um, this is one of many examples that I could cite uh, that where people talk about China uh, and it shaking up the international system and playing unfairly. It's summarized uh, beautifully in a book uh, that just came out by Martin Jacques, When China Rules the World, which paints a description of a world run by China in the coming decades uh, that in, in which the global norms which we now think of dominating, fair, uh, free, open trade, a liberal system, uh, is overturned by a China which is incapable culturally of abiding by that system, a system it didn't create. This paints, all of what I've shown you so far paints a very gloomy picture of how China is an anti-status quo power that is not interested in the current system, and it didn't create it. That very negative description of China is countered by other observers. Uh, Doug Guthrie from NYU uh, and others argue that the power of the market, uh, China's economic reform started in 1978, is pushing China inevitably to rationalize its economic behavior. Uh, if the, the requirements of efficiency, competition, the socialization process of participating in the international economy are pushing Chinese to wear three-piece suits. Uh, and he does research on state-owned companies in the Shanghai, greater Shanghai area and found that the more they interact with their foreign partners, the more they behave according to global norms. Uh, and their business practices look increasingly like our business practices. And there may be some of you here tonight, some who I met uh, at lunch this afternoon, uh, who do business in China. And you may increasingly be seeing this. Uh, the more they engage with you, uh, the more they learn uh, the correct rules of the road. Ed Steinfeld, who's at MIT, has summed this up in a book which actually isn't out yet um, called Playing Our Game. And what Ed is arguing is, is that in those parts of international business where there aren't clear definitive rules with teeth to hold the Chinese feet to the fire, uh, in fact what we are doing is extending our own regulatory systems to China. Chinese company wants to list on the New York Stock Exchange, or even in Shanghai or Hong Kong, well, they're going to hire a, a big eight accounting firm. They are going to comply with SEC regulations. They are going to improve their corporate governance. Uh, they want to export um, milk or other types of food products, uh, toys, other things. US FDA. Uh, it's opened an office in Beijing, and they go around China doing inspections. Basically, all the little parts of our regulatory system moving over towards China, the Europeans 
bringing theirs as well. And we are essentially outsourcing our regulatory framework onto the Chinese, and that this is filling that gap uh, which didn't, didn't exist before. And that's why the Chinese are playing our game uh, and leave, leaves Ed quite optimistic about the general trajectory despite these problems that we're seeing with the exchange rate uh, and, and technology. That, and those are short-term types of disputes uh, to him rather than uh, indicative of, of the long-term challenges. Now, my sense is that whether you are a critic of China because you think it's not playing by the rules, or you're like Doug and Ed, and you see the Chinese inevitably adapting to our system and playing our game, there are common assumptions that both of these two groups of folks hold, uh, and, and which I actually want to challenge. The first is that the basic questions that these folks ask uh, are common. They ask, is China meeting its commitments? The commitments it made to join the WTO, the commitments it has with its bilateral trade investment partners, the other uh, uh, dozens of international institutions of which it's a member. They want to know, is China cooperating uh, in global governance institutions and being a good, responsible stakeholder, as, as Robert Zellick uh, coined it in 2005? Why or why? isn't China living up to its commitments or being cooperative? This is the follow-on question. If they aren't, what can be done to make China be more cooperative? Uh, what can be done to make it live up to its commitments? All of that is underscored by a, a huge question that all of them ask is, is China an anti-status quo power? Is it out to change the rules of the game to be more consistent with how it views uh, international politics and business? I think those questions are common. Uh, I think uh, they are increasingly irrelevant. Uh, and I don't think that they get to uh, the heart of the matter uh, of, of where we're going to be in the next few decades with China. Uh, because they're based on assumptions about China and its relationship with the rest of the world, uh, which are appropriate when China was just getting ready to join the system or when any new member joins it, but isn't consistent with how one would think of the way average participants are part of the global system. The first assumption that both of these uh, camps hold is that the existing international system, the global norms, consistently promote liberalism and are fair. And I think while in general that is the case, uh, in general the WTO pr promotes openness and liberalism, as do most of the others, they don't consistently do it. Uh, they, in fact, as part of their fabric of the rules they have, uh, identify conditions and circumstances in which it is appropriate to protect domestic industry uh, against foreign competition. Uh, and those aren't just exceptions to the rules. Those are part of the basic fabric of the WTO and other institutions. And so when China is not playing, when China is not liberal uh, and open, it's not, it may not be simply because China is violating the rules. It may be because China is precisely following the rules. Both sides look at compliance and cooperation as the important measure. But countries who are in the international system uh, don't just want to comply. They want to promote their interests. Uh, the United States is part of the international system of the WTO, not just because they want to be a good citizen, we also want to achieve our interests. We want to use the rules to our advantage, as any good member would. We want to hire our lawyers to defend us when we have disputes uh, with others uh, and, and promote those interests through these institutions. To the extent, so let me give you an example here. Uh, 
The WTO is a terrific website. It's an extremely transparent organization as far as I can tell. Uh, and I've been to Geneva and interviewed many WTO officials uh, and p members to the WTO. Uh, this is just off the website. And you can look at the number of cases that countries have lodged uh, as either a complainant against another party or as a respondent where they've had to defend themselves in WTO proceedings. Uh, and this would seem to me to be a nice measure of compliance with one's commitments. Uh, if you're not complying with your commitments, it would seem that you'd be taken to the WTO quite a lot, taken out to the woodshed and, you know, spanked. Uh, well, China has been a respondent in 17 cases, which is three times as many more cases in which they've been a complainant, but the United States has been a respondent in 108 cases. Now, we wouldn't say from the, because of that data that the United States is an international scoff law in international trade and, and totally against the international system and anti-status quo, right? But the data shows that the United States is much more often a defender uh, and challenged about its trade practices than, than China is. So we, if you just are looking about whether you're complying or not complying, that really doesn't tell you enough about participation in the WTO and these international institutions. Something else is going on there, which isn't just strictly about compliance issues. The, another common assumption is that to the extent China is not open, uh, it's seen as an anti-status quo power which poses a danger to the international system and the United States. And we ought to think about whether or not it makes sense to always think about whether the rules promote openness, whether this, if one doesn't follow the rules, whether that means you're an anti-status quo power or whether you're a threat to others. And what I really want to do is have us change our thinking about how China participates in the system. And, be, and in order to help us, I want to start with a, uh, have a quiz. So I know since China is a really popular topic, as Dixie was saying, that you all must be studying Chinese. Uh, and you've probably studied classical Chinese and, and et cetera. So I want to give you a minute or so to translate this. And, and then this will tell us a lot about your knowledge of China, OK? So I'm just going to stand over here. You all can, you can cheat. You can talk to each other, whatever you want to do. Use a dictionary, OK? All right, quiz is up. Time's up. All right, let's see what we got here. All right, well, I study, I've studied Chinese since 1986, so I got a little advantage. But all right, let's start the, at the top. That's an L. That's an I. That's a T. That's a T. That's an L. That's an E. Little. That's a B. That's an O. Bow. P, E, E, P. You get it? Can you, you help us? All right. So little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and cannot tell where to find them. Leave them alone and they will come home with their tails behind them. By Xu Bing, 2002. All right. Things that look really complicated may be simple. And we, get our, we start thinking about things in one way. And if you just make a little change of your brain, it'll get a whole new way of thinking about things. And that's what I want to do with thinking about China and global governance. And so I thank Xu Bing, uh, a Chinese conceptual artist, who usually makes this in order to, to make Chinese people realize that their characters aren't so special. Um, are, is, is, is helpful to us. I want to inject a little bit of realism into the debate about China and global governance. So the first, which I've already mentioned, is that global rules intentionally promote both liberal and mercantilist behaviors. 
And to the extent China is mercantilist sometimes, that may be because it's pr pursuing, following those rules quite closely. The correct yardstick then for China and its participation in global governance institutions isn't just simply compliance or cooperation, but its effectiveness in pursuing its interests. It's the same measuring stick that pr President Obama would use for Ron Kirk, the US trade representative, and say, is he doing a good job? He wouldn't ask, hey, are you following all the rules? He'd say, are you promoting American interests, right? To the extent China is not open, again, it may be because it's not following those rules. Lastly, the distinction between the status quo or anti-status quo, I think that, the, that both infects the optimists and skeptics about China is false because the rules and norms of the international system are always evolving. Long before the Chinese entered the fray, we've been revising the WTO or the GATT uh, and the other rules of the IMF and things. And so there is no status quo that's stuck in stone against which we can measure the Chinese quite easily. Even more important than that, although in trade matters we have a very nice clear body of rules an arbitration mechanism to resolve disputes to say who won and who, who's right and who's wrong. In most areas of international economic behavior, there are very unclear rules or no rules at all. And since there are no clear rules in many areas, uh, it's hard to say whether the Chinese are status quo or anti-status quo. Is China living up to its commitments related to foreign exchange? We have no idea because there are no clear rules at all about what is the proper way to set an exchange rate and what its value should be. Finally, some norms of the international system deserve to be opposed. I want countries to be anti-status quo powers because there's part of the, parts of the international system which, in, which are horrible, they're bad for you and me, and we want both China and the United States and others to try and change them. And to the extent China is a status quo power, that really upsets me. So I, don't th I think we should not be wedded to the international system as it currently looks and measure China against that because there's parts of the system which we should all want to change. All right. So the questions that I'm asking and that I hope that you all continue to ask into the future is how are the Chinese learning the rules of the game? How well do they play these rules? Are the Chinese more adept at some games within the international system than others? Are they more adept at financial institutions and regimes or in intellectual property rights regimes than in other areas? What does greater ch Chinese playing mean for the rules and the system? Does China becoming more successful or more effective in these institutions mean that the rules are going to change? Or what's that mean for our interests? And given that, then what should we do? Should, do we need to learn the rules better? Do we want to change the rules? Those are the big types of questions looking forward. Not is China complying or not complying. That's a lawyerly question, which is great, and I'm glad that we have lawyers here tonight, and that's their job, and that's the job of Washington. But the job of, of Americans and what's important to us is how effective are they playing and how effective is America playing at these games. That's what really matters. You know, when a, when the, when a basket, I'm from Indiana, so basketball is important, right? Yeah. IU is really good now at not fouling a lot. <laughs> But, and, and there are very few technical fouls and ejections, but the IU alumni are, don't care. We want W's, and I think you all want W's as well for America. All right. Before I get to my evidence, I'm going to do something that academics don't usually do. I just give you my conclusions. All right. And then if we've got some time, I'll give you some evidence. That makes it easier for me. 
All right, lower the standard as far as I possibly can. All right, first, I do find that the Chinese are learning to be more liberal and more protectionist. They are going to school every day, literally, to learn about this system, and they are following the rules, and the rules teach them how to be liberal and teach them how to be protectionist. China is more active and effective in what I call producer-oriented regimes than in what I call consumer-oriented regimes. And let me tell you the difference between the two, okay? Um, there are some regimes in the world which primarily their goal is to help companies and manufacturers do a better job, to protect them, give them encouragement. Anti-dumping rules, safeguards, countervailing measures, technical standards rules. All of those things were created as a way to cushion industry against foreign competition so that they could recover uh, and, and deal with others through fair trade. In fact, the rules for anti-dumping, in fact, were written by the U.S. steel industry in the 1960s. They wrote them, and then we adopted them into our laws instituted them into the GATT, and then they're now part of the WTO. Rules related to intellectual property rights help those companies, those innovators, in which IP is a critical part of their value chain. The rules related, so these are all things that help producers. On the other side are regimes which are created in mainly to act as restraints on companies to promote the interests of consumers. So to the extent that companies follow food safety regulations or product safety or labor rights, what that does is add costs to their bottom line in a way that allows consumers to be better off. Credit ratings, competition policy are also checks on business behavior. So a credit rating is supposed to give a signal to investors of how risky a company is and how might it, whether it might not default on its debt obligations. So the Chinese, I'm saying, have schooled up and, and are doing really, relatively well in these regime areas and not as well in these. Internationally oriented Chinese companies are better players than domestically focused Chinese companies. And interestingly, they act as a break on Chinese protectionism overall because internationally oriented companies tend to have common interests with companies in other countries. And so they tend to promote positions in international institutions which are not necessarily consistent with the preferences of less competitive state-owned companies in inland China who have less business with the rest of the world. Uh, and this is really probably one of the most important uh, barriers to increase Chinese protectionism. Uh, they are the entrenched liberals in China. International negotiations over the fundamental rules, the Chinese typically are defenders of the status quo. If you look at the discussions in the WTO or in the IMF or in the G20 meetings that were originally held last April and we've had the summits since then, the Chinese argue for the most minor tinkering of the rules in these negotiations. They are basically satisfied with the, base, with the large framework of the international system and the things they suggest are relative minor changes. That may that is very different from most of the developing world. Uh, China doesn't generally represent their interests the way India and Brazil do. China, in negotiations, looks much more like the United States. Now, that may be reassuring, but again, there are parts of the system which I think we all should be anti-status quo on. And so China is, in some ways, uh, in hindering reforms in some parts of the system. China's ability to learn and perform uh, is inhibited to some extent by China's political system, by the uh, training that bureaucrats receive, uh, by the limits between limits on interaction between businesses 
and, Chi and Chinese officials, and by Chinese companies' inadequate knowledge of international rules. You can, I was in Geneva doing research and I was meeting with uh, an American uh, logistics company, uh, their government affairs people, and they knew WTO rules inside and out in exquisite detail. It would be very hard for me to have that same type of conversation with most Chinese business people, even those that had very large Chinese companies. And that makes it very difficult for them to give consistent, detailed advice to Chinese negotiators uh, that represent them. And a lot of times, Chinese officials then have to think, what are my interests? They have to kind of do their own calculation of that without knowing really uh, what Chinese industry thinks. Finally, the most severe conflicts that China has with other countries occurs in areas where the global rules are weak or non-existent. And so there's areas like with the WTO where we have very full-fledged rules, drawn out procedures, where we essentially get along. We have disagreements, but they're resolved in a, uh, a nice orderly diplomatic way, and the Chinese generally live up to their commitments. I can't think of a single case where the WTO is found against China where they haven't followed uh, the commitments and implemented the out, uh, as they should have. But there are lots of areas where there aren't clear rules, uh, where there are no teeth, where there's no consensus. That's where the biggest problems are. Uh, and that's where we need to put a lot of our energy in developing those rules. All right, those are my conclusions. Now let me give you a little bit of data and evidence for these things. All right, first, this is the WTO building in Geneva, a, a wonderful place. Um, and I, I've been uh, through that gate many times. And if you go in there, what you find uh, is a place that promotes both liberal and protectionist goals. Um, if you read the text of the WTO agreements, these are most of them, you'll see that they were written in a very lawyerly fashion. There's lots of clauses and exceptions in every one of these agreements. In addition to that, um, if you arrive in Geneva from a developing country, you're offered a chance to take a class at the WTO, uh, technical assistance, they call it. And what they do is they teach you about the rules of the WTO to help new members from developing countries understand when they get in negotiations uh, and interaction with everyone else at the, in Geneva how they should behave. These are usually 30-day classes. And the first day, it's the world is, we promote liberalism and openness and everyone holds hands and sings and, and it's just wonderful. The next 29 days they teach you how to screw the other guy in negotiations. <laughs> Very strategic stuff. How can you make the other side give up way more than you give up? That's the basic, what the classes are all about. And that's really how the WTO operates. It's how others can give in, not how you can give in. And so whether it's the rules or strategy, the WTO is this mixed uh, bag. Uh, across the street from the WTO and up the street are a variety of law firms, uh, some from the United States, like Sidley Austin, which is based originally in Chicago, uh, and others whose job it is to defend their clients in WTO litigation. Uh, and they do a tremendous uh, job of exploiting the rules and using them to the members' advantages. Another thing, so the WTO is like that. Also, the Chinese uh, can observe the dialogue that we have in general about the international system and, if, uh, and our place in it and if they do, they'll notice that Americans aren't just simply advocates of a liberal trade order, of free trade. Uh, many Americans are advocates of fair trade. And fair trade is very different than free trade. Fair trade means there's reciprocity, that also you can penalize the other party when they're not playing fair until they abide by the rules. And for many people, uh, many uh, free trade advocates see fair trade as really simply an excuse for protectionism. So you'll see the Buy American Act that was recently passed, uh, various coalitions, uh, even the U.S. Trade Representative talking about fair trade and the importance to enforce our agreements. The Chinese have not only seen 
our rhetoric on free trade, they've also adopted it with regard to fair trade. Chen Deming, who's China's Minister of Commerce, they're essentially their USTR. Um, for some reason, the Wall Street Journal loves him. And he gets to publish articles there all the time. And this one was just from a couple weeks ago. And I'll give you a little quote from that. Trade protectionism differs from legally acceptable measures to, trade, to protect trade. It is an abuse of remedies provided by multilateral trade rules. This kind of protectionism is morphing into more complex and disguised forms, ranging from conventional tariff and non-tariff barriers to technical barriers to trade, industry t standards, and industry protectionism. Now, if it wasn't written by him, you could think this would be written by Ron Kirk, who was talking about the Chinese. We talk at each other just like the other side. It's the mirror image. Uh, and so the Chinese have absorbed the norms of fair trade. And that actually ends up getting us to speak with the same language to each other, but also gets us speaking past each other as well. All right. Let me get a little bit more specific here beyond the generalities of the WTO and um, the norms of, of, fair, of fair trade to talk again about these lawyers. The Chinese have figured out that they need to lawyer up too. And there's lots of new international trade lawyers in China, what I call inter ambulance chasing trade lawyers. All right. We have our own, one of the best in the United States is Dewey and LeBeouf, and Tom Howell is probably the best symbol of this type of law firm. Uh, and he goes around protecting the US steel industry, semiconductor industry, and others, large, lodging complaint after complaint at the WTO uh, and with the US Commerce Department against others. Uh, and they get, he gets paid millions of dollars to uh, bring cases against the competitors of his clients. And they do an extremely good job. Chinese have their own. This is the Huan Zhong Lu Shi Shi Wu Suo. It's the Huan Zhong Law Firm. And their founder, Wang Xuehua, this gentleman right here, mouths the fair trade principles. And he has studied up on anti-dumping and countervailing duties and safeguards. And he goes around China and he goes, oh, oh, look, you've been injured. Look at that leg. Must be because of all those exports from South Korea that have been flooding under our market. And they go to the Ministry of Commerce and file complaints against the South Koreans or others and initiate cases to get received protection. All 100% consistent with China's WTO commitments. This is the global number of WTO uh, anti-dumping cases worldwide over the past uh, 15 years. You can see the peaks in uh, during the dot-com bubble after that. Uh, as your macro economy suffers, more of these cases are brought. Uh, you can see in 2008, the cases ticked up some more. In 2009, it's up there. Uh, a lot of these cases. The Chinese, through 2008, were by far the most common target of anti-dumping investigations globally. Now, if you add in the th Taiwan, the 34th province, uh, then China is really the number one target. All right, you got to laugh to know Taiwan's not the number one <laughs> province. OK, all right. So we're going to have to work on the geography. All right. Now, who's initiating these cases? India has brought the most number of anti-dumping cases. Uh, and this is new, because the Indians learned from the US and the European community to bring these cases. Down here at number eight, the Chinese. The Chinese now are active initiators of these cases. And in the past few years, they are number three in the most number of cases brought by countries. And so they bring charges. Who do they bring charges against? In 28 of 164 cases, the Chinese have accused Japan of dumping in, Jap in China. They've brought another you know, 27 cases against the European community or one of their members, 26 cases against US firms who they accuse of dumping in China, 16 against that little province, uh, and the others. So the Chinese are very adept at learning the system that we taught them. Now, here are the outcomes of a lot of these cases. 
Uh, I'm using a different number here. This is 48 products times 164, times the number of countries, so 164. If you look at how the cases turn out in China, it's a very interesting outcome. It's, these cases are brought by Chinese companies to the Ministry of Commerce that decides. You've got a basketball game in which the referees are on the side of the one team. Yet, in only 31% of the cases do the applicants win an outright victory. In most of the cases, you get a split decision. Yes, the Chinese get some protection and raise the tariffs against some of these competitors that are exporting to China. But sometimes the cases, but some, only some of the competitors get treated that way. Some of them face very low tariff margins or get off scot-free, a great phrase. Uh, in 21%, in 10 of the cases that it were decided through 2007, the foreign respondents won an outright victory. They dismissed the case, found no dumping. That's an amazing outcome for an authoritarian regime where the refs are on the home team. Why is that? It's those entrenched Chinese interests, liberal interests, those downstream consumers of the foreign products in China stick up for the foreign products in many of these cases. Let me give you a couple examples. Lysine. Now, I put, do we all put lysine on our cereal every morning? No, because it's a chemical additive for feed and chicken feed mainly. So don't, don't put it on your cereal. Uh, in 2001, the Chinese brought a case against uh, the US, uh, South Korea, and Indonesia. In fact, actually, what they were doing was targeting a company you may have heard of, BASF. BASF has subsidiaries all over the world. They had one in, in South Korea that was the primary target of this investigation. They threw on companies in the US and Indonesia just for fun. Well, it turns out that this gentleman, Liu Yonghao, who is the chairman of the New Hope Group, he's one of China's largest, most successful private entrepreneurs, um, has a feed company, the New Hope Group, which imports lysine to put in the chicken feed that they make. And they were against this case, as were other chicken feed producers. And so the case was dismissed. There are other interesting cases. Uh, another, I'll just mention one other, and I can come back to the others in Q&A. Electrical steel, the Chinese, uh, less than a year ago, brought a case uh, for electrical steel in which they targeted Russian and American electrical steel makers. These go in transformers, your electric grid, power grid. Uh, AK Steel, which is in Ohio, is one of the primary targets in the investigation. Uh, and they gave uh, provisional duties of between 4 and 25 percent. Now, if they really wanted to sock it to them, they could have. They could have made the tariffs much higher. But they didn't, because even though the Chinese steel companies that brought the case, Baoshan Iron and Steel and Wuhan Iron and Steel, Baogang and Wugang, are very powerful, the electric grid company in China is also politically powerful, and they needed this electric steel. So it hasn't been used as, uh, hasn't fully kept the Americans and Russians out of the market. All right, let me try another topic here if we're doing okay time-wise, right? Okay, and talk about standards. Uh, I was talking about standards at lunch, and let me talk a little bit more about them now. Uh, standards are probably, if you could think of a topic that's more boring, let me know. All right, it, it, it should be boring. All right. I mean, a bunch of nerds sitting in a room deciding, you know, equations for how to measure this and that. It, sh it should be totally, you know, leave your brain dead. But I found it fascinating because the business and politics of fights over standards are just tremendous. Uh, because there's many standards in which the winner, in which the standard can have amazing consequences for business success. All right. You just take your cell phone. All right. Um, I use um, this phone. This is a singular phone or AT&T. This is, operates on a GSM network. That was, this is basically putting a nickel in the pocket of Nokia and some European companies. Right? If you've anyone here got a Verizon, is Verizon here, right? 
So, yes, so that means what you're doing is you're giving uh, a little bit of money each time you buy a phone to a company in San Diego called Qualcomm, which uh, created the CDMA standard, which Verizon uses on its network. Uh, you think of beta versus VHS, et cetera. You get the idea that these standards are extremely important. And there are these, and the Chinese have realized that, and therefore they have stepped up their participation in all sorts of organizations around the world that set international standards, particularly in information technology and telecom. They are one of the most active participants, sending huge numbers of delegations, delegates to these meetings. But let me tell you about two cases uh, real briefly. Uh, we all know about Wi-Fi. We've all got it on our laptops, right? Uh, Wi-Fi is a standard developed by a group, the IEEE, uh, and pushed primarily by a corporate group uh, led by Intel, all right? Um, and you can go to the Wi-Fi Alliance's page and see all the members of the Wi-Fi Alliance. The Chinese. Um, for a variety of reasons, both worried about the security of Wi-Fi uh, and also about the potential benefits to make money, came up with an alternative standard called WAPI. Um, and they were going to require everyone in 2004 to take out Wi-Fi and put WAPI on their laptops or whatever mobile device you had. And it turns out that Intel Broadcom and the others that helped develop Wi-Fi all went ballistic. And they said, if you require WAPI and get, get rid of Wi-Fi, we're up and out of China. Uh, US government uh, was up in arms. Um, but even more importantly, Chinese companies, Lenovo, other big internationally oriented Chinese companies that care about standards were against WAPI. WAPI was not in their interest. WAPI was proposed and pushed by a group of companies with close ties to China's intelligence community based in Xi'an. So Xi'an doesn't have just nice terracotta warriors. It has a nice intelligence community and defense establishment there. And, but they're not connected to the most important Chinese IT companies. And so in April of 2004, in Washington, D.C., China's vice premier, Wu Yi, caved in negotiations with the U.S. She was caving not because Intel said they were going get, to get up and walk out of China, but because the most important segments of Chinese industry weren't for this. In other areas, the Chinese have been more successful in setting standards. Uh, home networking is a new area of standards that are being set. And again, Intel is one of the primary movers behind the DLNA home networking standard, the Digital Living Network Alliance. But the Chinese have been pushing two alternative standards. One is called IGRS uh, and another ITOP Home. And the IGRS group is actually led by Lenovo, but composed of several hundred Chinese, Taiwanese, Japanese, and American and European companies. Uh, and they have not only made this a standard in China, they've gone to the International Organization for Standardization and moved it entirely through that body, and IGRS. I believe has already been passed as an international standard and can compete head to head with DLNA. Now, and this is one of many examples. If you go to telecom equipment, uh, the company Huawei, uh, which is based in Shenzhen, is extremely active in setting telecom standards, just as important as Lucent or any American company in setting those standards. Uh, and they are, have learned to play the rules of the international standard setting game. And luckily, what we find is that the Chinese that are most successful at playing this game have interests which are, if not aligned with ours, the least misaligned with ours. So those promoting WAPI had the least chance to be successful because they promoted an, a technology which was entirely incompatible with anything and had very few inter, uh, international partners. Lenovo has developed an incremental technology and has lots of international partners and has learned to play the game in a much more constructive way. Let's talk about mergers and acquisitions. There's uh, many of these that occur every year, uh, totaling billions of dollars. Uh, but mergers and acquisitions can be 
uh, a bad thing because they can create market concentrations which are anti-competitive. Uh, there is really a very weak regime globally to govern mergers and acquisitions. There's an organization called the International Competition Network, which is essentially a talk shop for competition authorities from about 10 or 15 countries, and they just simply get together and chat with each other. Uh, and they don't really have any clear, fast rules. Why? Because the U.S. Department of Justice and the EU uh, antitrust authorities don't want there to be firm rules in this area. Well, the EU, the U.S., Japan, and since August of 2008, China reserved the right to review cross-border mergers and acquisitions that may have an impact on their market, even if none of the two parties to the deal are from China. We do it. So if there's two com an Australian company and a South African company that, that have business that would affect, affect their American business, they have to go to the U.S. Department of Justice and get approval. Same, they have to do the same in China now. You may have heard uh, about a year ago uh, from now, a year ago, uh, Coca-Cola was trying to buy a Chinese company, Huiyuan, a juice maker, uh, and the Chinese rejected this acquisition. Uh, they gave a paragraph explanation as to why, citing some very technical competition policy language, which was actually consistent with some decisions made in the EU and Australia in similar types of cases. But most of observers thought that the Chinese simply made a political decision uh, in which its premier decided they didn't, China didn't want Coke to get hold of a famous Chinese name brand, and so rejected the deal out of hand. And so showing that the Chinese aren't playing by the regular rules of the game. Well, that was just one case. Uh, and it's the only case so far that the Chinese have fully rejected. Uh, almost all the cases that have been submitted to the Chinese have been passed with no problems. One case in which there was uh, conditionality placed on the merger uh, was InBev's acquisition of Anheuser-Busch, in which, because Anheuser-Busch owns a large segment of Qingdao, our favorite Chinese beer. It's probably the only Chinese beer we can think of. Um, but if you go to Qingdao, actually, the Qingdao beer in Qingdao is much better than what you get in the store here. All right. Um, as a collector of beer cans, I know. All right. So um, in any case, back to the important thing, which is that the, they simply set conditions on whether on it, whether A B InBev, if they wanted if they wanted to raise their stake in Qingdao or other Chinese brewers, they'd have to go back for approval again. Uh, so conditionality on future behavior. Uh, but if you talk to InBev, they had no problem with the way the Chinese handled that case, and that's the way they've been dealing with most of these cases. So there have been about 50 plus applications uh, in the course of the past year and a half. Uh, only one refusal of the Coke Hui Yuan case, four conditional approvals. Chinese, China's antitrust, new anti-monopoly law also has a segment dealing with abuse of dominant position. That is, do you abuse your monopoly once you have it? Uh, the Chinese have brought zero cases against anyone. Uh, others have tried to lodge cases against Chinese companies, but nothing against foreigners. So I was originally thinking that if you're Microsoft or Intel, you ought to be preparing to be sued in China or a case brought against you, just the way they've been brought, just the way they've faced cases in the US and Brussels, uh, South Korea, and Japan. So far, we haven't seen anything like that. But I think that the Chinese are still practicing on others. Uh, but it, what we're seeing is that this is not part of Chinese industrial policy yet. All right, let me talk about one last area. Okay, and then, and then open it up. I love iron ore. I actually love standards, even if you thought I was criticizing, but I think iron ore is totally cool. All right. Uh, global iron ore is, is traded not on exchanges, uh, like mo many commodities. It's, tra it's traded through a cartel system, what's called the global benchmark system. There are only three important providers of iron ore in the world. Uh, BHP Billiton, Rio Tinto, and Vale. Two Australian companies, a Brazilian company. They control 80% of the market. Um, in the 1980s, 
Uh, they developed a system with the Japanese, which were then dominant players in steel and importers of iron ore. The U.S. gets a lot of iron ore from the United States, so they don't import a lot from Australia and Brazil. They, they, they developed this benchmark system in which each year the Japanese would negotiate with the Australians on setting the price for iron ore for the next year. Well, let me see here. The Chinese in the last 10 years have become the world's largest steel producer by far. If you look at the steel data, they're way up. So the Chinese since 2005 have been representing the steel and global steel industry in these negotiations. The negotiations have not been going well for the Chinese. Steel demand is going up, 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 up every single year. The price of iron ore is going up every single year. This is the price of iron ore. The deal reached each year. All right? The Chinese in 2009 wanted the price of iron ore to go down to 45% uh, and said that's as low as we're going to go because with the global financial crisis, there should be a glut of iron ore, less demand for steel. They got 33%. They actually didn't get 33% because they wouldn't reach a deal. They were so upset with the other parties that they essentially walked away from the table. They couldn't achieve a deal. The, Ch the uh, Australians and Brazilians reached deals with Japan and South Korea for 33% off. What did the Chinese do? They went and arrested four employees from Rio Tinto the main counterpart they're negotiating with, accusing them of engaging in corruption and stealing of state secrets. They later modified the charges to say they were stealing commercial secrets. And in their press conference lately uh, and in the media, Chinese media reports, they're saying that they accepted bribe, that the foreigners accepted bribes. What they're saying is that, in fact, Chinese steel companies were bribing Rio Tinto and Vale and, and BHP uh, for side deals on iron ore. So, but nevertheless, what you've got is this really crazy situation of one party arresting the other and this benchmark system essentially breaking down. Um, and that's where we are right now. Uh, they've resumed negotiations for the 2010 benchmark price, but can you have two parties which have less trust toward each other? No. That's because there are no global rules. Or the global norm, the global rules that are in place, these privately, this private cartel doesn't work. It doesn't work for the type of global market that we now have, and it needs to be adjusted. This is the most dangerous, not just for the four employees, but for China trying to have a consistent access to iron ore, for global steel prices to be normal, it's, uh, stable. Uh, this is a horrible system which, which needs to be adjusted. All right, so let me go back to my conclusions. I think the Chinese are learning to be more liberal and more protectionist. Um, they're more effective in some t parts of the system than in others. Internationally oriented Chinese are particularly effective, and they tend to be a break on protectionism. The Chinese overall aren't critics of the status quo, but defenders of it. They're defenders of the benchmark system more than anybody. That's a system that needs to be changed, uh, among many. Uh, the Chinese could be better uh, learners uh, if their political system was improved. And lastly, the conflicts, as I tried to show in this last case, are most severe where we don't have clear rules. All right. Let me stop it there and take your questions. Thank you very much. Questions for Dr. Kennedy? Two questions for you. One that you asked for earlier, and that has to do with lobbying. And how are the Chinese circumventing U.S. law in lobbying in this country with spending and foreign agent registration? And the second one has to do with playing with the rules. When you can walk into a shopping mall in Shanghai, that specializes in counterfeit product of any kind that you could imagine. 
that is blatant in the shopping mall, how can you say that they're playing by the rules? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, let's talk about the lobbying question first. So um, the Chinese are very active lobbyers. The, the book I wrote, The Business of Lobbying in China, looks at lobbying in China and how uh, both Chinese companies and foreign companies, including American companies, lobby Beijing to influence China's national economic policies. Uh, China doesn't have rules on registrants for lobbyists or things like that, but American companies uh, are in China both individually through trade associations, through uh, lobbying firms, law firms, uh, actively lobbying Beijing every day. Uh, Chinese companies have begun to lobby in the United States, uh, although not to the, degree, to the degree to which American companies lobby in China. Uh, I haven't done research on the extent to which they hire registered lobbyists uh, or, or don't. I know in the case, I know of individual examples like when uh, Chinese national offshore oil company Sinuk tried to purchase Unical, uh, they hired lobbyists, but late in the day for that. Uh, and in fact, Chevron hired lobbyists, uh, and they were much more effective than, than, C than Sinuk. Um, so there's only actually, I can find only three Chinese companies with, oops, he's unhappy with my answer. Uh, with three uh, permanent re re offices in Washington whose job it is to, to lobby on a regular basis. Uh, I actually uh, am, I would like it to be more transparent. I would like American lobbying to be more transparent regardless of whether foreigners are involved. But I think lobbying is a good thing. I think overall it's really important for, government, for officials to know what uh, industry and other stakeholders really think. I, I would like it to be more transparent, give, have a more balanced playing field for other interests, uh, for a variety of interests, uh, labor, other types of groups. Uh, but I generally think that type of interaction is, a, is part of the daily activity of democracy. So I I, that in and of itself isn't, as, I, I'm not too concerned unless there's bribes or other things, which then I'd, I'd, be, I'd be really worried about. Um, I'm not saying the question about intellectual property rights. Actually, uh, you're talking about Shanghai? Right. So my watch is uh, from that same market, so um, I have to confess. Uh, and if, when I ask my students in class uh, in Bloomington if they've ever copied music or video online, you know, everyone says yes. So, um, so, but yeah, the Chinese do it out in plain sight. Um, what I'm saying is that in most areas of the system, uh, Chinese behavior isn't... Um, blatant violations, although there are, what we need, I think looking forward, the biggest issues are how the Chinese use the rules uh, to their advantage, not just the violations. In fact, the United States brought uh, a couple intellectual property rights, rights related cases to the WTO um, in the past couple years. In one case, uh, the US won. Uh, that the outcome went in their favor, and we're seeing the Chinese modify uh, their uh, behavior with regard to, for example, distribution. In the other case, uh, uh, the, Ch the U.S. essentially lost. The U.S. said that China's criminal penalties were too low to dissuade intellectual property rights from uh, being violated, and the WTO actually found in China's favor. For, for that case. So I'm not saying that they, uh, China is, that if you go that there's piracy isn't a problem or counterfeiting isn't a problem. I'm saying what uh, seems to me most relevant uh, in most, in many areas is the, the game that occurs within the system, not the uh, cl clear violations. Okay, um, with respect to playing by the rules, uh, Give us your thoughts, please, on how the Chinese are using the geopolitical rules um, to leverage their position with respect to China, excuse me, with respect to North Korea and Iran. And just also maybe some insight with respect to what the decision making process is in the, the higher up level of the Chinese government and how those decisions are made with respect to how they react to. Um, this is flying across Japan, things like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wish I had insight into senior Chinese uh, leaders' decision-making and was a fly on the wall. Um, 
if I did know, I couldn't tell you. So uh, all I can, but I can tell you that I don't know. So I'm going to engage in educated speculation based on my conversations with Chinese scholars and others who pay attention to the foreign policy making process. Uh, and and so there's that caveat that you ha that you have to begin with. Um, I think the, uh, with, re with regard to North, these are two separate issues, but there are some, some, some things that bind them together uh, that get to the bigger point I was trying to make. Uh, it, with regard to North Korea, uh, the Chinese clear top goal is no war. Our clear number one, and then number two, is no acquisition of nuclear weapons by North Korea. Our top priority is no acquisition of nuclear weapons is first, no war is second. So they're both important priorities, but we've got them in reverse order. Uh, and so the Chinese are doing everything they can to make sure a war doesn't break out. But if that means that, but they're unwilling to squeeze North Korea enough to make sure that, that North Korea would give up their weapons. So what they're doing is they um, impose temporary sanctions on North Korea to bring them back to the six party talks when they walk away from them. But they don't exert enough pain on North Korea to force them to actually give up their plans. Um, and I think the basically American goal is essentially to, to negotiate this forever. Our, our strategy, it, our tactics are our strategy. Uh, on Iran, the Chinese are really concerned about ac access to petroleum. That's their number one concern with regard to the Middle East. Um, the U.S. has tried to, and, and because the U.S. was so dominant in Iraq with all the, because of the war uh, since the Gulf War in, the, in 91 uh, and our relationship with Saudi Arabia, Iran was the next obvious place for the Chinese to go. And they've ha developed that relationship because of that. The U.S. has tried to push, to try to create more opportunities for China in Iraq and Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. Um, and, and reduce the Chinese opposition to sanctions or other types of, of strategies against Iran. But I think it, um, it's unclear to me that the Chinese are going to give in enough uh, so that you can have a viable sanctions system. Although I was reading just in the New York Times yesterday about uh, non-Chinese companies, American companies and others in, that get American government contracts uh, but who are also doing business with Iran. So. I'm worried both about Chinese behavior as well as ours. But I think in both cases, uh, the issue is uh, nonproliferation. That's, that's the goal. But the global nonproliferation regime, which, which is extremely detailed, all right, and which is very clear and signed up to it, uh, creates two kinds of countries. Countries that have nuclear weapons, that are allowed to keep them in perpetuity, and everyone else who's not ever allowed to have them. And with that kind of system, uh, that creates um, dilemmas uh, for both kinds of countries. All right? uh, and so when you have those two types of classes, that's a hard system to keep in place. Originally, then, when the NPT was created in the early 70s, the idea was that those with weapons would eventually give them up, that it wasn't meant to be permanent, although now we're in a de facto permanent state. Uh, and then we've seen over the past few years some countries be grandfathered in, Pakistan, India, uh, Israel probably has nuclear weapons, South Africa did, and so Iran and North Korea are out there, well, it seems like this is a political arrangement, not a, a even justice system. So I think there's issues that relate to the NPT uh, that are just as important as sort of, you know, the U.S. tactics vis-a-vis -vis any individual country. Uh, the United States has borrowed a tremendous sum of money from China and other countries. Uh, how are these loans structured in terms of repayment? And secondly, what would be the impact if down the road there was a political upheaval in China? Okay, all right. Um, uh, China has, uh, as far as I know, uh, their banks lend very little to um, American companies, uh, but China is a large consumer of American treasury securities. Right? Uh, as far, uh, at the end of December, China had $894 billion in U.S. treasury securities. They were number one ahead of Japan, which is around $800 billion. All right, and so these are uh, treasury notes that China's central bank holds. 
Uh, if and so I'm not so China. When you say China is our when we say China is our lender, uh, what we mean is that their central bank has taken these U.S. dollars and recycled them into Treasury securities rather than brought them back to China, which would then lead to inflation in China and other types of problems. Um, I'm generally uh, not too concerned. I'm concerned that the U.S. has a large, uh, consistently a large trade deficit. Uh, I'm not cons terribly concerned that it's the Chinese that hold this debt. Uh, the Chinese are tied to us at the hip at the shoulder, at the ankle, at the knee, at the head. Uh, any, de any loss in value of the U.S. dollar or inflation in the U.S. is bad for China. It takes that $900 billion and turns it into $800, $700 billion, And then China's central bank has to turn around and listen to Chinese public opinion, which is extremely upset that they're watching that money disappear when you have people making a dollar a day in parts of China. And they say, why don't you take this money and invest it in more productive resources? So I think the Chinese really don't want to see the U.S. economy suffer. And because of that, uh, I'm not terribly concerned because they're holding our debt. I do think that there's issues related to the dollar being the uh, main currency of, of, of trade, the main reserve currency globally that we have to deal with. Um, but I don't think it's because China is, is part of uh, the equation. Okay, thank you very yep. much. What a meaty presentation. Thank you. I think I understand a little more now what our international law firms and, and bankers do. And incidentally, for all of you, um, the link to the research center is in your program, in case you'd like more information on Dr. Kennedy's Research Institute. Next week, we have um, Special Agent in Charge, Andy Arena, who is head of the Detroit FBI office, who will update us on um, what's new in global crime. So next week, uh, a real life G-Man. So thank you all for coming out tonight and we look forward to seeing you next week.